continuing the, we're talking about attitude. Say attitude. Attitude. So um, my father-in-law, Nels, shared two weeks ago. He's still here. They went to, fi- there, yeah. Lori and Nels are still here. They went to Finland and uh, visited there, but they're back for a few more days. So we're enjoying all the time we can with them. And um, so he began and he shared an excellent message uh, two weeks ago. Um, real practical, good stories. And then Eric shared last week, attitude determines your altitude. And I love the um, illustration of the plane, how it's called attitude. And you want to point your nose up, I think was my takeaway and just connecting to that. So I wanted to continue that. I want to talk about attitude of the heart. And uh, this was not what I was thinking I was going to talk about with attitude, but I really felt... um, I felt like the Lord was speaking to me about this uh, heart. Can you say heart? The heart. Um, Okay. So we're going to talk about attitude of the heart. How many of you, um, how many of you like going to the doctor? (laughs) Andrew does. Yeah, I know. That's true. (laughs) When, uh, I don't know if it's a man thing and a woman thing or it's just some people, but my, my take is, is that when men go into the doctor, you know, to get a diagnosis, we want to be in and out, right? Boom. Get in there. Get out of there. Because it's almost like you're tempting something to just go into the doctor. Like, if I go there, they're going to find something. Probably it's nothing. And, um, and then, okay, women, forgive me. But women go in and they want to like, they, like I go with my wife. And if we're bringing our kids in, I just listen to the doctor and I go, yes, thank you. But she's like, what about this, this, what about this, 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 and this, and this, and this. And I'm like, oh, my word. I would never have even thought about those kind of questions. So sometimes we want the full checkup. If you go in, you want to get your money's worth. <laughs> right? Yeah, Okay. So imagine you have a really serious issue, a real serious problem. You go into the doctor, you walk in, he's like, hey, great to see you, shakes your hand, and go ahead and you can pay the secretary or the office manager on your way out. Thank you for coming. She'll give you the prescription. Wouldn't that be frustrating? Because we want a real diagnosis, don't we? I mean, I think we do. Yeah, I would want one if I was, things were going bad. I would want to solve the problem, right? And uh, sometimes we, I think we live our lives um, and we like, we don't, either we don't go in to get the diagnosis or it's like as soon as we get in, we go out. I think we got to figure it out. Just give me a paracetamol, I'll be grand. But um, if you want to, really like identify the situation if you really want to get to the what the problem really is you they doctors really have to i mean i had i had some doctor visits before and they do things that you do not want them to do they i shouldn't get into it but they'll look at you and they'll touch you and they will do stuff that is uncomfortable and why because they're trying to get to the heart of the issue. And so here's the definition of diagnosis. diagnosis. The identification of the nature of an illness or other problem by examining the symptoms. So you're looking at the outside to figure out what's going on below the surface. I, you, Dio can correct me later if I'm go, going way off. But... but if you give a, if you, how do I say this? A shallow diagnosis will lead to a shallow solution. A shallow diagnosis will lead to a shallow solution. So we got to get a better diagnosis. So this passage of scripture in Mark um, Jesus, actually, a few people are giving diagnoses here. The first one is going to be the religious leaders giving a diagnosis on the disciples. 
The second one's going to be Jesus giving a diagnosis of the religious leaders. And lastly, it's going to be Jesus giving a diagnosis of everybody. Say everybody. Are you ready? Because you know what this is about. It's about you. I'm going to be gentle, though. Right? Don't you want a gentle? I'm not the doctor, but Jesus is, and he's gentle. Thank God. Gentle. All right. So let's look at these passages. Um, Here we go. Mark, verse 1, chapter 7. One day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands as required by their ancient traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they immerse their hands in water. This is but one of the many traditions they have clung to, such as their ceremonial ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law asked him, they asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples follow our age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. So these, I don't know if you see this, but these religious leaders are like, look at them. They're dirty. Why aren't they doing things to make themselves clean? Reminds me when I was a teenager, I don't know if any of you did. Would you do this? You'd see one of those, find it. Aha, look at them. (laughs) Wash me, write all these different things on the car. And this is my picture. They're like gathering this crowd, pointing out the dirt on somebody else. What's the dirt on you? So what they're doing is, like, I, we don't fully understand this, and actually Mark's readers didn't understand this fully because they weren't Jewish, the ones that he was writing this book to. So you see, he had to kind of explain, you, if you read it, you see it, it's in parentheses. He's explaining to his readers why this was a big deal to the Pharisees and to the Jews. And just like us, because I don't think we really get it. Like, what's the big deal? I know we wash our hands, right? That's good hygiene. But what's the big deal about pointing it out and making a big deal about it to Jesus, this religious teacher? Well, the big deal is, is that for the Jews to be, um, to be right with God, to be right to approach God, you were meant to be clean, not defiled. And so, you know, that's kind of... It's understandable a little bit. I'm going to explain a little bit more. So, for example, in the Old Testament law, they weren't supposed to touch something that was dead. That would make them unclean. They weren't supposed to eat certain animals because that would make them unclean. They weren't meant to touch mildew stuff because that would make them unclean. Um, So there were a variety of things. Touch open sores, unclean, become unclean. And it was like giving a picture that if you're going to approach a holy God, then you need to approach and be prepared and clean before a holy God because he's clean. He's perfect. And so it might seem kind of funny for us and comical, but, um, but it's a good question. Why be clean for God? We actually do understand this because if you got a hot date, you want to be prepared, right? You're going to put the makeup on. You're going to, you know, hopefully you're going to take a shower. You know, you don't want to, you're not going to want to be smelly for them, right? Because we want to, when we're with somebody, you don't want some green thing, especially that first date, you big green hunk of thing in your teeth. Hi. And so we get it. We get that. Or, you know, you have this job interview. What's the worst thing that could happen? Your kid throws up all over your front when you're going to the interview. Disaster. Because when we approach somebody that's important, that we want to make a good impression on, we want to approach clean. Why be clean? So, do you feel clean or unclean? Do you feel? And, um... 
So we, I think sometimes we can think this kind of like, that's like for superstitious people, ancient history, like it's not irrelevant to us. We don't really think about it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you guys do because you were church people, so you, some of you know this story. But a lot, a lot of people don't think about this too much, like do I need to be clean for God? It's not really uh, a big deal. I, in fact, I was in um, Lister Square, I remember, a few years ago, and I was talking to somebody about Jesus, and I was like, so do you believe in, you believe in sin, right, and, and evil? I was like, there's no such thing. Man just made that up. There's no, there's no sin. There's no uh, evil. And uh, this, is, this is really like our culture tells us that there, like there's no uncleanness. There, just do whatever you feel, right? Just if it makes you feel good, do it as long as you don't hurt anybody. There's no, you know, if you feel guilty, find a way to just get rid of that. Pretend like it doesn't exist. If you feel ashamed, man, that's not good for you. Just throw that thing off. Just do what feels good. So this is the world that we live in, and um, I think the reality is, is that for the most part, all of us in some way feel unclean, not enough, not good enough. Like, ugh, I probably do have something in my teeth, only it's a little deeper than that. And um, if, I think if that guy was honest, I would have loved to, like, just really talk to him for a long time. We didn't have a long conversation I think it's easy to say that there's no sin or no evil, no such thing, until you get punched in the face. And then you're like, that's, how could you? And so sooner or later, you're going to say that's wrong and this is right. And uh, it's just practical. So, um, man, hand, think about hand washing. Do you remember those COVID days where we all had to super wash our hands? I, I was talking with somebody during those days, and they, they confessed to me. I don't know if it's because I'm a pastor that they needed to go to confession, and they're like, no. Sometimes I go, you know, to the toilet, and the only reason that I go near the sink is because other people are in the stalls with me to wash my hands. I was like, thank you. God bless you. Some of you probably do the same thing. You know. All right, but so hand-washing confessions. So these Pharisees are pointing out the dirt on these disciples. Hey, look at them. Not only to Jesus, but there was a crowd there. Look at these guys. They're supposed to be spiritual followers of you, this great religious leader, but they don't even, they don't even care. So... Uh, do you feel clean or unclean? I, you know, we, I talk with um, my wife and I talk with other ladies in particular. And there's this sense of either I feel like I'm too much. And if I don't feel like I'm too much, then I feel like I'm not enough. And back and forth between these uh, and uh, stuck. Some of us guys, like, I, I think that we try to almost, like, earn our cleanness. If I work hard enough, then I'm going to be good enough. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, you know, I was talking to somebody really close to me, and, the, and I, they were, like, they were anti-marriage. And I was talking to them, and I, I was thinking, uh, they just don't want to commit. They just like to play the field. They like to just mess. But when I really got down to a deep conversation with this person, they actually opened up to me, and they, they said something like, Noel, I'm afraid to commit, not because I don't want to commit, because, but because I'm afraid when I commit that they're going to see the real me, and it's not going to be enough, and they're going to leave me. And so we all have this sense, like, we got, I'm just thinking about, like, having a piece of paper wash me, walking around with this thing, burdening us. Whether we're Christians or we're not, there can be that sense, wash me, under the surface, wash me. There's no escaping this sense of, like, we failed. So now let's look at what Jesus diagnoses the religious leaders, and I'm going to read 
few verses in this, in this um, conversation. So Jesus replied to the religious leaders who are pointing the dirt out on the disciples. He said, you hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. He goes on to say to the crowd, because there was a crowd there as well. He said, um, Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Can you say heart? Heart. These Pharisees were, um, we, like when you read this, you just think it's like a conversation, like a friendly conversation. But these guys wanted to kill Jesus. We already found out about this in the, the third chapter of Mark. They were in collusion with Herod's group planning for a way that they could kill Jesus. So th this wasn't just a nice conversation between religious leaders, you know, a pastor meeting up with a priest or something. This was, these guys were trying to make him look bad so they could set him up to kill him. And so they, they actually, they traveled, they did a walk of 36 hours in order to get to him. And that's like us driving to Moscow. So th this was no mess. And these guys were, they were out to, to take Jesus out. And so Jesus is gentle, right? I said that. Remember, Jesus is gentle with you. But sometimes he is, he's going to call it as it is. He will call you out. And he did this with these guys. They were, and um, so he says to them, you hypocrites. And we know, do you know what that is? It's an actor. You actors. You're amazing actors, but you're living horribly. You guys got this down, man. You are good. You're like Denzel Washington level acting. Oh, my word. But your living is bad. Uh, I think um, you, it seems like there's not a huge amount of things that make Jesus angry. But self-righteous acting is, makes Jesus super angry. So I don't want to do that. So. Look, I want to share with you some questions to ask you. <laughs> Are you a good actor? <laughs> Remember, I'm being gentle to you today. Qualities of a great actor. I got this off the theaterschool.com. Qualities of a great actor, they're captivating. They draw everybody in. They show confidence, right? Have you ever seen actors? You know, they're like confident on screen, but have you ever seen them off screen as well? They know how to pose. They, they're, they just got it all together, you know. They work on their performance techniques. They, they've done this over and over and over. They know how to make it look good. They know it so well, actually, that if the best actors, you don't even realize they're acting. That's like real life. This is real. And then last of all, they have some sense of vanity. And vanity is kind of like a valueless pride. It's kind of like those IKEA computers. Did you ever go through IKEA? One time I saw one, it looked so cool, and I touched it, and it fell over. It was cardboard. <laughs> just empty. Looked, looked real, but it was just cardboard. No computer. Vanity. Great actors. Are you a good actor? Don't be a good actor. <laughs> These guys were so good, they fooled themselves, I think. Okay, why do we do that? I don't know if you do that. Let me propose that you might be a good actor, because I can propose this to myself. Jesus called it out in others, so there's a possibility that could be us. I think we act because we feel unclean. We act when we feel unclean because we want to be clean. And the reason that we feel unclean is because we have guilt about the things that we've done, the bad things we've done that makes us feel unclean. Or we have shame, which is that I am just bad. So guilt is about 
the things we do. Shame is about who we are. And so we either want to cover it out, cover it up, or get rid of it. That's what we do. It's a human condition, I think. And um, so, so we act. And know what else we do? We point out the dirt on others. And it makes Jesus mad. Makes us feel good temporarily. Doesn't it? Man, I love. Sometimes it feels so good to point the dirt out on others. Because then you don't have to think about the dirt on you. Oh, my goodness. I mean, sometimes I love, um, okay, you know, first of all, religious people do this, okay? Church people do this because we're talking about Pharisees. Sometimes us church people can do this. Um, We'll be like, man, they did that, that, party there, drinking this, with them, and then with them, and ooh, look at them, right? Right? But did you know irreligious people do the same thing? Those church people are so judgmental. Those church people always think they're so goody, goody, goody. Do you see the situation? Everybody's doing it. Religious people, irreligious people. We're acting. and We're pointing out the dirt on others. Why? It makes us feel good. Because we don't have to think about our own dirt. So this is not a fun message, is it? <laughs> it's not fun if you're, if you're thinking, if you're listening, if you're considering. Um, because it, like even politics, it's so much fun to make fun of the, the people that you disagree with. Like, you know, don't you love those kind of TikToks or Instagram? Oh, yeah, those lazy people, those big government people. Uh, see, look at them. And then you got the other side. Well, yeah, but what about that greedy corporations? Uh, look at them. And w- it's kind of fun. That's why I think it's fun. Smile at me for a second. Is that fun? No, you don't like that. Some people like that. Um, it, it makes us feel emotion. We, um, anyway, I think it's fun sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my word. But I don't like it when it's the things that I agree with. So my point is not that we should never make judgments. We got to make judgments because there's, there's greedy, there is lazy, there is bad, there is good. But first, what Jesus says, take the plank out of your own eyes so that you can see the speck in the others. That's the situation. And so he wants you to stop acting, pointing out the dirt on others until you come to realize your own situation. So Jesus is diagnosing these Pharisees, and he's saying, you self-righteous actors. And that is uncomfortable. Um, Okay, let's go to the last one. Are we having fun? People are leaving and everything. I don't know. I mean, hey, I must be speaking a good message. I'm going to try and make you all cry, because then you really have church. Okay. Number three, Jesus diagnoses everyone. We try to make everybody feel bad here at Life Church. That's what it's all about. But I'm, I'm being gentle, because I really, I think the Holy Spirit, he's, he's talking to me about this. He's talking to me about my heart and examining my heart, going beneath the surface of my situation, and um, so let's look at this verse. He, go, he goes on. It says, Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd. And so the disciples asked him what he meant by all this that he was talking about to the Pharisees and then to the crowd. And then he added, it is what, come, it is what that comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, Come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. So Jesus said, there is such thing as being unclean. The Pharisees said they're unclean. Jesus agreed there is such thing as being unclean, but you're not going deep enough. You got to go deeper. 
Stop pointing out the surface stuff. Look below the surface. It's coming from the heart. That's the mountain that you got to deal with. So Jesus diagnosed the problem. It's not always out there. It's not always Bambi thug. It's not always the politicians. It's not always out there. You got to go deeper. Although sometimes we got to call that stuff out too. Education systems, those things. But go deeper, Jesus says. So Jesus diagnosed the problem. I had a car that like spewed black smoke. And I could have blamed it on the oil or I could have blamed it on my lead foot. But the real problem was it, an engine problem. We had to get rid of the car or replace the engine. That was the situation. So Jesus calls sin, sin. But he, he does it in such a way that um, this is our, our challenge as believers in Jesus that we have to like clearly call sin, sin, but we do it with humility because we're sinners. It's super easy to call sin, sin and have fun doing it. But it's a totally different heart when you realize, well, that's just like me. Just a good reminder, I guess. And because Jesus hates it when self-righteous people point out other people's dirt without acknowledging their own. And so he lists all these symptoms. He's, he goes through these. Some of them are thoughts. Some of them are actions. They're just all sin. And what he's saying is, is that you're a mud factory. We're mud factories. Okay. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Good word, Noel. No amount of um, external cleaning is going to make you clean because you're a mud factory. Like you, like 5% better this year, just go get them, is not going to help your situation because you're a mud factory. So I think you know what I'm going to get to. You need God. <laughs> we need God. We need Jesus. And so what do we do? Ask God's help. He wants to help. It's the way he's wired. And, you know, some of you are thinking, well, I'm already a Christian. I already got that job done. No, you did not. You need more. I mean, it's not job done anyway. It's, it's done, but it's not done. It's done, but it's not done. You're, some of you got to process that. Um, because we live, um, we live, we still have this thing called our flesh. But yet we're called to live by the Spirit. And so there's this tug of war that we continue with. And so we got to every day ask God's help. And maybe even, maybe I don't even need to say every day, but maybe in this season, you're like, Lord, I've been feeling unclean. I've been feeling not enough. I've been doing the same thing that I don't want to do. Lord. Noel's talking to me. Ask God's help. He wants to help. It's the way he's wired. I just want to point out some attitudes of the heart, because this is what I was talking about, attitudes of the heart. That might be too small for you. I'm just going to read through the, some of the attitudes we could have. In the left side would be desire for revenge, fear of man, Pride, love of self, self-preservation, fear, covetousness or greed, envy, hatred, anger, desire to be approved by people, anxiety and fear, rebellion. Well, God wants to change those. Whether we've been a Christian for, um, you know, two days or we've been a Christian for 40 years, God still, you know, I love the scripture, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He who started the work will complete it. So then these are new attitudes that he can build into us, entrusting ourselves to God, fear of God, humility, love of others, laying down our lives, perfect love, generosity, open-heartedness, love, forgiveness, desire to be approved by God, 
peace and commitment, contentment and submission. Can I invite the worship team? We're just going to do this song together. And um, what, I, what I would like to do is essentially to say, here's my heart, Lord. And I just want to take, as we sing this song, I would like for all of us to open up our hearts to the Lord and uh, just get honest with him, maybe about areas that we've just been moving through our life. Let me not think about that. I don't want to go to the doctor about that one. But you know it's still there, and he wants to touch that, I believe. He wants to give us victory in that. So will you stand with me as we close this off?